Thanks, Rita. You're watching Southeast Today, our top story this evening. The failings in the care of a mentally ill man who walked out of a Kent hospital and was later found dead. Nobody with mental health issues should be forced to be left in a hospital for 22 hours without the proper supervision and care. Four suspected people smugglers are charged over the deaths of six people in the Channel last weekend. The joy, the relief and the despair. We're with some of this year's A-level students as they open their results. We're also at the Clearing Call Centre in Canterbury where the lines opened at 8 o'clock this morning. And a sea of sunflowers, the Sussex Farm, where pickers have 300,000 to choose from. They're really big and they can grow, like, really tall. They're just awesome. <laughs> Hello. First tonight, the Kent man who was tormented by his mental health problems, who walked out of a hospital unnoticed and who was found dead on a beach in France a short time later. An inquest has heard how Daniel Veens was last seen leaving the QEQM hospital in Margate in August 2021. His family spent five months searching for him, only to find out that he died two weeks after going missing. Today, a coroner found the care Daniel was given fell far short of the standard expected. His family have been speaking to our health correspondent Mark Norman. Daniel Veens was a musician, a poet and an artist, but he also lived with mental health issues, drug and alcohol abuse. He died after absconding from a and &E in Margate and today his family heard a coroner describe his care from the health service as falling far below what they should have expected. To recognise that there was massive failings in the care that was supposed to have been provided to Daniel and a recognition that there needs to be fundamental changes made because nobody with mental health issues should be forced to be left in a hospital for 22 hours without the proper supervision and care. And support and not feeling safe. After being admitted to A&E in 2021, doctors recognised he was at high risk but they failed to monitor him, failed to fill in documentation around his care, and he absconded. Daniel drowned in the English Channel two weeks later, washed up on the French coast. But problems identifying his body meant his family didn't find out he died for five months. The emotional impact it's had on you as a family of this taking so long to get to this point on oh, top of the office line. I can't even put it into words. It's been, it's, it's just, it's been uh, devastating. Daniel's family now plan to hold an exhibition of his art and music to raise funds for mental health charities. They hope it will in some way keep his memory and his talent alive. Well, Mark is at County Hall for us now. And Mark, Daniel's family believe his death was avoidable. Very much so, Natalie, and it centres around this issue of how he was monitored. When he was admitted to A&E, he was considered an amber risk. He should have been monitored, so eyes on him 24 hours a day, and that simply didn't happen. And then there was this two-hour window where he absconded, and as we've just heard, the tragic consequences of that. In the coroner's court here today, there was also a lot of discussion around how long it takes mental health professionals to assess someone who's having a mental health crisis and is in A&E, clearly not an appropriate place for them, and issues around how the IT systems don't talk to each other. In the last few minutes, the Mental Health Trust, KMPT and East Kent Hospitals have issued us with a joint statement. They've apologised again to the family, talked a lot about how they've improved things since Daniel's death and how they're working together and some discussion around introducing safe houses to move a, uh, mental health patients out of A&E far more quickly. Some of that will appease Daniel's family, but as you've heard, they were bitterly upset today and they're going to go away and consider how best they can live with Daniel's memory. Mark, in Maidstone, thank you. Four suspected people smugglers have been charged in France over the deaths of six migrants in the Channel last weekend. The suspects, two Iraqis and two Sudanese, were detained shortly after the vessel, carrying around 65 people capsized on Saturday. Meanwhile, those who survived the incident have been speaking of their ordeal and said there were far too many people on board the boat. James Dunn reports. 
Rescue teams carry migrants to shore in Dover, some arriving on stretchers. Six people lost their lives last weekend when their boat sank off the French coast. 59 people, many of them Afghans, were saved. Now two of them have spoken of their horrifying experience, saying the dinghy was overloaded. When the boat sank, people were screaming. It was a very difficult moment. Six people died right away. We thought of death and prayed that our sins be forgiven. When the boat split up, it was quite dark and we could not see anything. We were very scared. I kept swimming for the sake of my parents and my brothers and sisters because we have left home and are going through all of this suffering for their sake. Seemingly undeterred by this tragedy, dozens of men, women and children arrived in Dungeness yesterday after crossing the channel in rubber dinghies. The calm conditions saw a total of 444 migrants make the crossing to Kent. I'm happy that I did not die and will not try again to go to the UK. If anyone wants to ask for asylum, it's best to ask for asylum in France. They should not go to the UK, it's too dangerous. Fawad says he's unsure whether he will try again to cross the channel. Four suspected people smugglers have now been charged in France over the deaths. James Dunn, BBC South East Today. A Kent police officer has admitted having an inappropriate relationship with a woman he met through his work. PC Thomas Hill from Deal pleaded guilty to misconduct in a public office at Southwark Crown Court. The court heard the pair met while the woman was being investigated for an offence and then had a brief relationship in December 2020. A strike by ground handling staff at Gatwick tomorrow has been called off. The workers, who were members of the Unite Union, received an improved pay offer and will now be balloted on the deal. The unions say tomorrow's walkout at the airport has been suspended as an act of good faith. But if the workers reject the deal, strikes planned from Friday the 25th of August will go ahead. Some bus services in Kent and Sussex could be affected by strike action next month as staff are balloted over what they've described as terrible pay and conditions. Brighton and Hove buses, which run services across the city and beyond, including Tunbridge Wells and Shoreham-by-Sea, say workers have rejected a 10% pay increase. Now, thousands of pupils across the southeast received their A-level, B-Tech and T-level results today. Most had sat formal exams for the first time after their GCSEs were disrupted by the pandemic. There were celebrations across Kent, Sussex and Surrey for those who got the results they needed. And as Leanne Rinney reports, many have told us they're proud of their achievements, given what they've had to deal with over the past three years. Oh, well done! <laughs> Emotions always run high on results day, but for this year's A-level students, it was particularly nerve-wracking. Thanks to the pandemic, they had never sat a public exam before. Their GCSEs had to be assessed by their teachers. I think the main thing that affected me was the uh, revision load, because obviously GCSEs, the last year, it wasn't as heavy with the exams, and now that it obviously was more in one exam, the revision was pretty heavy. So yeah, I got better than I expected, to be honest. I was a little bit nervous about picking up my results because I was like, uh, some of my exams I was like, a little bit mm, about. Um, but I got better than I expected in, in two of my subjects, so I was quite happy with that. Here at Herne Bay High School, 99% of students got their first choice university, which compares to 79% across the UK. We've got students going into the Royal Marines, the Armed Forces, um, as well as students going off to Russell Group Universities and those staying locally. So for us, it's about 60% that go to university, so it is a real mixture. This year, the proportion of A or A-star grades has dropped back to pre-pandemic levels as expected. But behind all the statistics, every student has their own struggles, dreams and story to tell. <laughs> yes, God. Vlad Pokiovich fled the war in Ukraine to study at Brighton College and has now secured a place at university. I'm really grateful to Brighton College, to everybody here, all the pupils, teachers, staff. Um, really grateful because only because of them I managed to get into university and to get such a good education. So yeah, I can't be more grateful than I am right now. 
So whether it's gratitude, relief, <laughs> shock or excitement, this year's students can officially close a chapter of education affected by the pandemic and look forward to the future. Leanne Rinney, BBC South East Today. Well, some students claim they've been disadvantaged by the marking system this year as the proportion of top grades fell. For those who didn't get the results they needed for university, the clearing system has, of course, become an option. As of this morning, there are 29,000 courses and 8,000 apprenticeships available in clearing after the total number of students accepted onto a UK degree course fell by 2.6% compared to last year. Well. Peter Whittlesey has spent the day at the Clearing Call Centre at the University of Kent. And Peter, I know it's been a very busy day for them there, hasn't it? It certainly has. And clearing here is a marathon, not a sprint. It started at 8 o'clock this morning and won't close till 8 o'clock this evening. There's call centres like this on three floors, 130 people taking those calls. And it's all about getting the right courses for the right people. Good afternoon, University of Kent Clearing Hotline. Sophie speaking, how can I help? This is one of more than 4,000 calls to the University of Kent's Clearing Hotline since the centre opened this morning. For those on the other end of the line, results day can be super stressful, but many of those taking the calls have been through clearing themselves, so are ready for a mixture of emotions. I think she was my first call. The applicant um, seemed really upset, um, was worried that she didn't have an offer. Um, as soon as I asked her for her applicant ID number and checked her application, I saw she actually got an unconditional firm offer from us. So that means she's been offered a secure place at the university and immediately her and her mum started screaming over the phone and it just put the biggest smile on my face because, you know, we've been able to turn that frown upside down. This year, clearing is expected to be busier than normal. That's because in England, A-level grades have dropped as marking systems have changed for the first time since the pandemic. Well, it's busy and it's normally busy. So please don't you know, worry if you're in the situation where you're needing to talk to a university about is there a place available for you. There are, yes, of course, some differences this year because of the, the changes in the way that exams are being marked and the changes to grades. But yes, it's still an opportunity. Please do do call, talk about your options because there will be something for you. Robin Jones came to Kent through clearing. She's just graduated and said in retrospect, missing out on her first choice university was a blessing. It's, it's amazing to now have gone through and done my three years and look back and realise that actually this is probably the best fit that I could have had um, and I never would have expected that. I've kind of come out of clearing better off, which is a really weird thing to say. So for those going through clearing now, the advice is don't panic, just choose a course you really want to do. Well, the latest figures here are 3,200 people have applied for courses today. And it's all about getting those right people for the right courses. But clearing isn't just for people who missed out on grades. If you've done better than expected, you can also go through clearing. Or if you want to do a different course altogether, together, clearing is also for you. Now, over in Brighton, there have been strikes at the University of Sussex, but their clearing centre has been open and all clearing centres will be open again tomorrow morning. Peter, thank you very much. And for more information and advice about results, you can visit the BBC News app or tune into your local radio station. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. It is exactly a quarter to seven. This is our top story this evening. A coroner has ruled that the care given to a mentally ill man from Kent who walked out of hospital and was found dead a short time later was far short of that expected. Daniel Veens left the QEQM in Margate in August 2021. His body was found on a beach in France two weeks later. Also in tonight's programme... This is a crucial time for the Cub. We meet the man behind the camera for some of the most memorable wildlife moments. And the sun has had its hat on today, but waterproofs at the ready tomorrow. I'll give you a full forecast later on in the programme. Well, the sun was out, the skies were blue on the Sussex coast today. 
perfect conditions for Eastbourne Airborne. It's one of the biggest events in the Sussex calendar and hundreds of thousands of people are expected to attend over the next four days. One of the highlights today was supposed to be the Red Arrows, but they've had to cancel because of technical difficulties, as Lucinda Adam reports. Dynamic, daring and high octane. Acrobatics and nostalgia shared the skies over Eastbourne. The team's been going for 10 years now. We're basically just a bunch of mates who get together at the weekend and do this for fun. On the Sunshine Coast, the sun came out, but not everything went swimmingly on day one. The Red Arrows have top billing on all four days, but had to pull out today because of technical issues. The wing walkers got stranded abroad and high winds meant parachutists couldn't jump. But the crowds were still making the most of the action in the air and on the ground. What are you enjoying about the show today? Everything. Everything, e just everything. the planes, the stalls. Yeah, everything. It's brilliant. This is me and my family. We've came from Seaford. Absolutely loving the show. Planes are amazing. Oh, it's really good. We come every year. I've got to admit, I like the loud ones. I like the really scary ones, you know, like a vroom, straight by. It's a variety of aircraft, it's a, it's a free public display for everybody. It's a really nice thing to do in the middle of the summer. Yeah. There are more than 40 displays this weekend of aircraft, old and new. And it's that variety that keeps enthusiasts and thrill seekers of all ages coming back here year after year. Airborne costs almost half a million pounds to put on, and after a few rocky years, organisers have worked hard to make it cost neutral through sponsorship, donations and commercial sales. We do need everybody to buy a programme, put their money in the buckets and just support it as much as they can. And it is the biggest free event, you know, for, for some miles. It is, it is. And, you know, in these days of the cost of living crisis, a free event is really good but we do have to make sure that we can make it sustainable. With three more days to go, the forecast looks promising for a full and fantastic flying spectacle this weekend. Lucinda Adam, BBC South East Today, Eastbourne. Great stuff. Now, we are all familiar with my next guest's work, whether it's the mother polar bear with her cub or the emperor penguins being hunted by a seal. He has filmed some of the most famous wildlife moments on our television screens. Doug Allen is David Attenborough's cameraman and he's worked on series including Frozen Planet and Blue Planet and won a whole heap of awards for his work. Before we meet him, let's have a look at the pictures. And as you hang at the surface or swim down to them, they will come up and meet you. They come up and meet you. They're full of curiosity. They're full of friendliness. Eider ducks break the silence. They have stayed here braving the northern winter instead of flying south to warmer climes. minutes with my son in the company of these sea lions and it was one of the most lovely, gentle, beautiful experiences that I've ever had on the water. Oh Doug, thank you for coming in. You brought in <laughs> one of your up. many Emmys and also the, the old Bolex that you Bolex started out first with. <laughs> ever camera, an old clockwork machine. Lovely. And you're on a tour, which brings you to Folkestone, talking about some of this mm. amazing work. I bet everyone asks you this, but what's the, what's the one you're most proud of? I think, I, think, I think when you get the chance to come up close with big mammals, so those, those whales that you saw earlier on, I mean, when you get a big 40-ton mammal coming up <laughs> and you can literally make friends with it, 
it's just amazing. Wales, as close as I am to you, that is just magic. And Doug, when you're in that moment with that 40-ton mm -hmm. mammal, can you appreciate it? Or are you just concentrating on the focus, the technicals, to yeah, get the well, shot? That's the reason that you're there. But often with the whales, you know, you know that you've got all the stuff that you want and you can take your eye down from the eyepiece and just enjoy being in the presence of that animal. So the first priority, yes, is to get the images, but yes, there is time sometimes to, to enjoy the whole experience of being out there in the wild with those animals. That's the biggest privilege, I think, of wildlife filmmaking. And what was the most tense moment for you? Uh, well, there was a walrus grabbed me at one point when I was snorkeling in the water. It came up from underneath and thought that I was uh, probably a seal. So it grabbed me and uh, that was a bit, a bit hairy for a few seconds. I was able to swing the camera around, hit it on the head and it swam away. But if it had held on and taken me down, <laughs> They kill seals by sucking their brains out, you know. Oh, Doug, so, so <laughs> thank goodness was... you had that camera. Exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very glad you survived to tell the tale. You need to tell the viewers about your Emmy as well, because there's a very that's different a story behind yeah, that. Yeah, that's especially... <laughs> half past five in the morning, the phone rang, and it was the Avon Constabulary Police asking me had I been burgled. I looked around the flat and I thought, no, this is fine. But then I suddenly thought of the garage, went round and sure enough, somebody had broken into my garage. And I said, that's really impressive. I didn't know I'd been burgled. Uh, how did you know it? Well, they had stopped the car at half past two in the morning and in the back, they found something that definitely belonged to the driver, my Emmy that the guy had stolen. My name is on it. So with Ace Detective work, they Googled my name, phoned me up and there I was. They did ask me, how come you've got an Emmy in the garage? And I had to say, well, I've got eight all together and it's just too much to keep them all in the house. Yeah, you run out of toilets. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> now, I need to ask you about Sir David Attenborough. We heard his, his mm -hmm. inimitable voice just then. He was instrumental, wasn't he, in, in your career yeah, choice? Yeah. I met David in the Antarctic before I had even picked up a movie camera. I helped him and a small film crew back in 1981 and they were such a good bunch of people, completely professional, but really good fun to be with. And I would defy anyone who had the two days experience that I had with David and the others not to want to be part of that group. And they explained how it worked. And so I had another chance to go to the Antarctic. I took that camera with me and <laughs> brought back some footage, sold it to the BBC and just that was it. That was the start. So oh. it was great. It was, I mean, David was wonderful. Is he he's, as lovely as he, he, is as he seems? Is like, he's the most generous, um, good humoured, lots of good stories, etc, etc. Totally helpful. I just, I mean, I'm so lucky that my time as a wildlife filmmaker overlapped with, with his time as, as the best presenter around. Amazing stuff. That's great. Doug, it's been lovely to meet you. I'm very glad you escaped that walrus. <laughs> Thank you. It's been great to be here. <laughs> it's our pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, nothing says sunshine more than sunflowers. And just as summer arrives, fields of gold have sprung up across Kent, Sussex and Surrey. One particularly impressive display is at Tully's Farm near Crawley, where you can go and pick your own. And as Charlie Rose reports, they're celebrating a successful crop after a disastrous one last year. sea of sunflowers. 300,000 they reckon, ready to be picked and taken home. I like the fact that they're really big and they can grow like really tall. I love all flowers but mm. these are just beautiful, there's just so many of them. And what is it about um, sunflowers that you like so much? Uh, they're very pretty. Sunny, aren't they? Yeah. Make us happy. Mm. They're just awesome. <laughs> I love the colour. Sam and Stuart Beer have managed to turn this field of gold into a real money spinner after last year's crop was destroyed by the local wildlife. We had all the sunflowers planted, they got up to about three foot tall, checked them, find them on the Monday evening, we'd, we'd sort of semi-fenced it. We have a big deer problem around here. Wednesday evening, the whole lot had gone. Um, literally the deer had come in and they chewed the whole lot down to just stubs in the ground. It looked like somebody had come in with a strip. <laughs> There's now an electric fence keeping the deer at bay, allowing even the tiniest creatures to enjoy the display. 
I thought sunflowers were yellow and that's it. But yeah. look at all these different kinds. Incredible ornamental ones that are varieties. There's about 100 varieties that we could have, could have grown, I think, and this is about 20 of them. Mm. Um, first time we've done them. So this is the first year that we've done a, a set of colorary ones like this. And we'll definitely be doing that again. It's re they're really beautiful. And when the flowers have faded, the birds can feast on all those seeds. Charlie Rose, BBC Southeast Today, at Tully's Farm, near Crawley. Now, we're just hoping those sunflowers are going to survive the rain tomorrow, John. You're not predicting a very peaceful day. Oh, we'll cope. <laughs> we'll cope. The sunflowers will cope, but they will be uh, drenched by something other than sunshine tomorrow, yes, uh, as will... We humans, it was lovely on the beach today, but uh, yeah, there are some storms around. As far as impacts are concerned, this is the lower end, I think, tomorrow, but uh, there is a warning from the Met Office, so it will be uh, a bit of a shock to the system after the clear blue skies and sunshine, which we all enjoyed today. This is the troublemaker out west, a lot of cloud, and there's some lumpy cloud ahead of that, actually, but uh, for most of us at the moment, it's fine and dry and bright and some late sunshine to enjoy out there. As we head into the night, so I think the cloud will start to increase, but uh, through the night time at least it will stay dry. Uh, quite a mild night as well, temperatures not falling all that low. Mid-teens as we start the day tomorrow. That breeze will still be with us, that'll be a key feature of the weather through tomorrow, as will those storms now. It'll start off dry, but it probably won't stay that way. As I say, there is a warning from the Met Office, very hit and miss, but the potential is there in the atmosphere uh, to produce an awful lot of rain in a very short space of time in some places. Starts dry, it probably ends dry, but in between there will be this band of uh, heavy showers and thunderstorms crossing the region. Brightness following on, a very muggy feel to things. Temperatures where the sun does pop out could easily get up into the uh, mid-twenties. That's not the end of it, because as we go into tomorrow night, uh, we could see some even heavier rain developing again from the southwest, and I think uh, this spot of rain has the potential to bring some very, very nasty conditions on the roads late on tomorrow evening. That'll clear through. And then we settle into uh, a decent weekend, actually, a getting better sort of day on Saturday. Bright and breezy, not ruling out a shower, but most of us will see a lot of sunshine, particularly down towards the coast. And temperatures, yeah, pretty good again, low to mid-twenties. As we head into Sunday, and indeed into the early part of next week, so we'll lose the wind, it'll start to feel very humid again, very muggy. Now, there is a lot of heat, as I mentioned yesterday, down across the more southern and central parts of Europe. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Still has the potential to head our way, but at this stage, it doesn't look like getting too hot, just comfortably warm through next week. We lose the storms and we get that sunshine back, which will please those sunflowers, I'm sure, Natalie. Yeah, well, let's not get those temperatures too much higher, John. Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. That's it from us for now, but Charlie will be here with you after the national news at 10. Bye-bye.